Hello and welcome to the Facebook uh, discussion tonight um, on the effects of uh, chemotherapy and radiation to the teeth and oral cavity. My name is John Mason. I'm a dentist here in St. Charles. Uh, I've had the pleasure through the last several years to come to Living Well and talk with a live audience regarding uh, the, the uh, dental uh, ramifications of chemo and radiation treatment. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight on Facebook and we'll manipulate this and do the best we can. Um, with me also is Sue, and Sue is uh, here at Living Well, and she's going to be monitoring, monitoring uh, any questions you may have that you can post on comments, and at the end of the talk, uh, she will relay those to me, and we'll have a discussion on those. We also might have uh, some comments from Karen Webster. She's a dental hygienist um, who is uh, active with Tri-City Health Partnership, and I've asked her to uh, be involved. She may have some more ideas on products that are available. Uh, and she may chime in as the questions come in if you have specific uh, uh, questions or concerns on different types of oral products during chemo and radiation. Um, Living Well is a, a great place, a great resource for cancer treatment uh, and help. I shouldn't say treatment, but it is part of the treatment with the different resources they have. And I know in our practice uh, as dentists, we are quick to refer the many patients we see, whether it's head and neck cancer or other uh, issues they may have. And they always come back with uh, glowing reviews of the type of care they've had here and the help. So it's always a pleasure for us to be part of this. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, a couple things. Um, head and neck cancer is one of those things that uh, oral cancer specifically makes up anywhere from 5 to 8 percent of all cancers, depending on who you uh, talk or read about. Um, and there's, with head and neck cancer, um, Typically, anymore, depending on the type it is, you can have radiation treatment to the head and neck area or chemotherapy. Uh, one of the, uh, it used to be in the day that your common risk factors would be heavy smoking, heavy drinking, but certainly over time, uh, we've had uh, oral cancers that uh, are in non-smokers, non-drinkers, and certainly most recently, the um, HPV has had a, a real impact on head and neck cancer. Um, in the day, it was uncommon to see a young head and neck cancer patient. Today, it's more common where you can see anyone from 30 to 60 that has a, uh, a head and neck cancer related to HPV. Um, the, 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 if there is anything fortunate which about with an HPV type of cancer is that it has a very, very high cure rate. Um, and the treatment can be anything from surgery to radiation. Oftentimes surgery can take care of it. Sometimes it's a combination of surgery and radiation. It really depends on the uh, uh, where you happen to be having it done and what surgeon and or larger medical facility, what their comfort level is and the kind of results they've had with their treatments. Um, with uh, head and neck cancer treatment, and I'm going to move right into the radiation effects because those are really the most significant as it relates to head and neck cancer. Um, there's a few things that in particular really uh, stick out. And the first is mouth sores. Um, it's called mucositis, which is just an inflammation of the inside of the mouth. It typically starts to, you start seeing it anywhere from two to four weeks. The radiation treatment, depending on the program, could be a six to eight week course. 
sometimes depending at that two to four week uh, how patients are doing they may have to take a little vacation time because of the soreness that can arise when the soreness does come in, if you can imagine, it's, it's like having a, and, and I may be talking to the choir, oftentimes when I come to these programs in the audience, there are people who have been through the treatment and they, they're they a much better uh, person to really say what it's like in terms of what it really feels like. My experience is just in talking to them and uh, the the kind of symptoms they're having, but if you can imagine just the inside of your mouth going down your throat where you have like a, the worst sunburn you can have, a blistering type sunburn, and in the oral cavity, uh, when that happens, and typically the radiation oncologist or dentist who might be helping out uh, will give you uh, different rinses. A lot of times they just refer to it as a magic mouthwash rinse. And the primary component in that is usually a local anesthetic, which really just numbs the inside of your mouth. And some also uh, uh, Benadryl, kaopectate, things that help coat the inside of the mouth that actually like act like a Band-Aid to help hold that local anesthetic around. It's strictly palliative care. Um, it's not going to make it go away. And it's really the, 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 the hardest part that people that I have talked to uh, as part of their treatment, uh, leaving out if there's been a surgery involving removal of the jaw that the, um, the patient has. And oftentimes the burning gets uh, significant enough that uh, they may, you might go through periods where you actually you can eat and you might need to uh, have a feeding tube placed. Some of the things that can be helpful during that time that we talk to people about, of course, are um, protein shakes. Scandi's a shake, S-K-A-N-D-I, is one that people uh, have mentioned that they can be helpful. Um, the saliva along with the pain becomes very thick and ropey and with that it becomes very difficult to swallow and uh, even in taking some of the medications they have a hard time swallowing some of the things that people have mentioned that could be helpful is if you take ginger ale or 7-up and you leave it out for a little bit just to get rid of a little bit of the hardcore carbonation that when you drink a, uh, where you need to take a pill, you can take it with that, and that helps break up some of the, the thicker, ropier saliva so you feel like you can swallow a little bit better with that. So mucositis or a burning on the inside of the mouth, uh, along with the um, uh, difficult in swallowing, it are probably the biggest things initially. And again, usually somewhere in that two to four week time frame, it can be a real uh, issue. The one other item that can be helpful besides the magic mouthwash is you, they do make a lollipop that's a, a, a numbing type lollipop. And you can put that in your mouth and suck on that. And that too can be helpful prior to eating to help create some numbness so that you can eat by mouth. Um, taste, typically during radiation, will go away. Will, you'll lose your sense of taste. Uh, that typically happens anywhere from, you know, it could be four to eight weeks. Um, it typically always comes back. It may take as long as six months. Sometimes people will say that it comes back almost all the way, but not quite there. And of course, when we, when we live in a time of COVID, more people have had experience without taste. Um, and some people with COVID, as we know, have lingering uh, effects of no taste. Certainly with the radiation, you'll have no taste, but generally speaking, it'll come back to some degree with time. Dryness uh, is a, uh, a, per a particularly long-term issue, and the dryness in the mouth, uh, if you can imagine 
the uh, saliva acts as a protectant to our teeth for the formation of decay, caries, or cavities, you know, whatever, whatever you're used to hearing. Cavities, unfortunately, is, it's caused by bacteria, but when the bacteria gets in our mouth, in a dry mouth, it sticks more. And it typically sticks along the gum line and in between the teeth. And with that dryness and with the bacteria uh, literally hanging on at a much uh, greater tenacity than when we have our, saliva, our normal saliva, you're very, very, very prone to having um, decay form. So with that, um, we, we try as part of the follow-up have people use fluoride. And there's diff most toothpaste have fluoride, and that's always a good toothpaste to use unless you have an allergy to it. But there are prescription fluorides that we'll use during cancer treatment and, uh, with, and radiation, particularly uh, not only uh, during the time of treatment, but certainly shortly thereafter. When you go through the treatment, sometimes wearing um, what we will make what's called a fluoride carrier tray, where you put fluoride in the tray and you put it in the mouth. Typically, you wear it for five minutes. During treatment, oftentimes you can't do it. Once the mouth starts to calm down, when the mucositis goes away, then it's a good idea to use the fluoride five minutes a day. Or if you can't use a fluoride tray, we'll have people brush it on their teeth. Um, it's strictly a preventive, uh, along with um, it's not magic. Uh, one of the things that you find when you try to increase your saliva that you'll start using different types of mouth candies to try to encourage uh, salivary flow. And the problem with that is that it erodes the enamel and really feeds the bacteria in the mouth and it can really precipitate uh, a much faster incidence of decay. And usually what you'll find in people that where it becomes more rampant is that the decay forms at the neck of the teeth and then you start filling around the neck of the tooth, the teeth start to wear because you don't have the saliva as, it, as a friction. It's almost like an oil, a lubricant. So your teeth start to wear more, they take stress, they begin to lose their, uh, the structure at the gum line and then they have a tendency to snap off. And that's, that's the worst scenario because then it becomes very difficult to build those back up over time. So prevention is key. And um, certainly uh, it's a good idea. And we found through the years, oncologists typically will have you see the dentist uh, prior to starting radiation treatment. Uh, they usually do that where we have to sign off that we've taken a look uh, teeth that are not able to be saved because of poor gum reasons or significant amount of decay really need to come out at least two to four weeks prior to the start of radiation. And the reason for that is the effect radiation has on healing. It compromises the, the blood flow. Um, so you really want to try to remove those teeth and get in a preventive mode uh, right off the bat. Um, most dentists, you don't need to necessarily see a specialist. Uh, and there is no like oncology dental specialist. Most dentists should be very familiar with this. Um, and they should have this kind of conversation with you. Um, because and for most people, we live in an area where they're seeing their dentist regularly. Uh, they will give you some, uh, once they are advised and you let them know, they'll go through and really check your teeth for teeth that have looked to have poor prognosis from a gum perspective and decay perspective, and those should uh, come out. Now, when you look to the future, because dryness is going to stay as uh, a factor, that you'll get some saliva back six months to a year, 
but it's typically the thick, ropey saliva. And of course, then again, you're going to be wanting to use things to try to encourage saliva and or using more carbonated drinks, which could be, again, a not a, they, they do present a risk for increasing decay uh, on the teeth. So the, uh, the fluoride, of course, helps with that. But if you have a tooth that becomes a problem that needs to come out, and this can be from a tooth that abscesses, has poor bone support, or unfortunately in back molars, depending on the amount of radiation they have and the, the concentrated site of the radiation, it can encourage bone loss around a tooth where it might need to come out. Well, those teeth, as they come out, the healing can be very poor and you'll hear a fancy word called osteoradionecrosis. Osteo just means bone, radio means uh, radiation, necrosis means death. So if a tooth comes out and you've had significant radiation, the bone in the area of the tooth may not heal, and so you have little pieces of bone that work their way out. Sometimes they can be picked out and it can heal over, um, but the dentist taking that out really needs to, uh, it, it can be a little, uh, a very compromised situation and you just don't want to take a tooth out with, without some precaution. Oftentimes we'll have an oral surgeon get involved with that. Um, it used to be in the day that there was a treatment called hyperbaric oxygen that was very common to use. It's not quite used quite as much now as it used to be, but the idea of what this hyperbaric oxygen is is that you might spend, you know, six to eight weeks in a chamber where you're in a highly concentrated oxygen environment to help encourage healing in areas that are compromised blood flow because of the radiation. Um, that's a discussion that needs to be had with the dentist, oral surgeon, and radiation oncologist if you've gotten a situation where the tooth might need to come out after you've had significant uh, treatment with um, radiation because of a head and neck cancer. Um, People sometimes will ask, um, what's it like to wear a denture after treatment? Uh, your mouth is dry, and dentures typically, what helps hold them into place is the, the bone and the type of tissue that you have that the denture's holding on to. A moist environment typically is a better situation for a denture. So, there are things that you can uh, use to help hold them in the place, but it's, it's not quite the same as it is when you're able to have um, a, a mouth that has a little bit more normal type saliva. But you can certainly wear a denture, you can wear partials that come in and out, root canals. Um, you'll hear, can I have a root canal after I've had radiation? Root canals are not a problem after radiation. They can be done, they can be handled, and usually they go along very uneventfully. Um, what about implant placement? Um, implant placement's a little bit of a different animal. Uh, it depends on where the radi radiation's been, how concentrated is it. And that is definitely something that would need to be discussed with the oral surgeon uh, at that time because you, it, you need to have a little bit more tender loving care in that case and to make it the most predictable uh, that the implant will take. Products. Um, most of the products are geared towards dryness. And um, because that's where most of the complaint is. And through the years, there's been a lot more products that are, that are on the market. And everybody has different ones that work best for them. And in fact, some people are saying, oh, it's, it's okay, but it, it's just not the same. But it, it becomes very difficult to keep moisture in the mouth. 
There, there's a, a company called Spry, S-P-R-Y, S-P-R-Y. Um, you can Google Spry and you'll see a litany of different oral products that they have. In the area, you'll usually find them at a fruitful field um, or at a health, uh, kind of a, a um, holistic uh, type store. Um, Whole Foods may have them as well, but in today's day and age, getting on the internet, Googling Spry, usually you'll come up with a litany of products. They do not require prescription. As it relates to dryness, they make a couple different products. One is called Rain Spray. It comes in a little bottle and it gives you a couple spritz so you can keep it in your pocket, you can keep it in your purse, you give yourself a couple spritz and it just helps keep moisture in the mouth. A lot of people like that. Uh, it doesn't last a long time but it's easy and they, can, they come in different container sizes that are small and easy to carry around. It's moisture, it's got uh, what's called xylitol. Xylitol is a sweetener that the bacteria in our mouth has not figured out how to use to create, to cause, help promote uh, cavities. It has a little aloe vera in there as well. And uh, you can keep it at your bedside when you wake up or have some dryness and, of course, through the day. Um, the other product, and along with spry making one, is called Biotene. B-I-O-T-E-N-E. Biotene usually will be at an OSCO or a um, CVS, uh, Walgreens. Um, you may have to ask the pharmacist. It too is not prescription. But biotene along with spry makes an intraoral lubricant. And what you do before you eat or before you go to bed at night is you put some on your tongue and then you work it all through the inside of your mouth. It has a little bit longer lasting effect than the, the spray because it is a, a Vaseline type lubricant. But there again, uh, you, you, you typically you need to use it a fair amount. And most people like to try the spray and the lubricant just to see what works out best for them. Everyone has their own little nuances what seems to work best. Um, you'll also see what are called xylomelts. Those you can find at most drugstores. X-Y-L-I-M-E-L-T-X, xylomelts. Uh, those you can put in your mouth. They have like a little adhesive area. It's non-cariogenic, meaning it doesn't promote decay, but it just helps stimulate more saliva in the mouth. Now, between those three things, again, most times I hear people like spry, uh, rain spray, and then the intraoral lubricant, and then you get into some of these different mouth products, but they're all worth trying. I think Karen's um, Webster actually, and she may chime in, Karen, as you listen, uh, but there's a couple other products that she's used that she's had uh, success with, and Sue's nodding her head that she has, and so I'll mention those as well. Um, in today's world, with all the marketing and products, you'll also see toothpaste for dry mouth and rinses for dry mouth. Um, they're, they're more, uh, people use them, they really, to be honest, say they don't help a lot, but it's one of those things that if you like the taste and you like having it around, if you brush your teeth, it doesn't hurt to use it. ACT, A-C-T, was probably one of the uh, earlier mouth rinses that um, you'll see for dry mouth. And that's, that's in most pharmacies. Even Walmart and Target, you can find that. But uh, there again, uh, I, unfortunately, I wouldn't expect a miracle, but it's one more thing you can try. There's just so many different products. Um, 3M makes a spray product. Uh, that one, you, it does require a prescription. Um, that's something you can ask your dentist about, 3M. 
Um, it's a spray that you just squirt in your mouth. Um, I haven't heard a lot of feedback on that. Uh, we've given some out as, uh, for, uh, to be used as trials, but nobody's really come back and said, oh my goodness, that was just amazing how that helped. They do try with some of the, like Sjogren's is a disease that affects saliva, dryness. Um, there's always these treatments where they stimulate the nerve. Uh, that We don't do that. That's something you can talk to a rheumatologist about. Um, varying effects. Most times people just wait it out six months to a year. Things get to be a little bit uh, uh, more moist and go from there. Whereas some of the uh, uh, Sjogren's diseases and those kinds of things, it's always there and always dry to the point where um, that's something you could talk to a rheumatologist about to see if that, if that might be helpful. Um, chemotherapy. So that's kind of a uh, looking at radiation, which really has really significant effects on the oral cavity in a lot of different areas. For those that have chemotherapy, whether it's for head and neck, breast, uh, pancreatic, all the different cancers, they don't have such a direct effect on the mouth. Uh, most of that is all in passing, meaning that depending on the chemotherapeutic agent, you might get mouth sores. Um, that usually happens. That can happen as soon as a week or two after the uh, chemo. Uh, when you look to how, what can be helpful there, that goes back to the magic mouthwash, something that, that you would use as a rinse. That's very transient as you go through the chemotherapy. It hurts, but it won't stay on for long lasting. It rarely gets to a point where you can't swallow, like sometimes can happen with radiation. So that you can talk to your dentist or radiation, or excuse me, your oncologist, about, oncologist and usually they'll have some thoughts for that as you go through the chemo. Dryness, too, is usually v transient with chemo. Um, it's just an effect of the medication and the changes that are going on, and that typically comes back much quicker than, let's say, with radiation treatment. Um, Taste is affected uh, as well. Most people will say it's a uh, metallic type taste. Uh, most people say that comes back as a general rule. Sometimes it's a little bit more lingering. Um, there's not anything specifically that you would uh, use in the mouth to help increase uh, your uh, sensation of taste. Uh, and again, fortunately, most times that comes back with time. So probably the biggest thing with chemo is the transient mucositis that you might have. Some people, as they come out of chemo, they'll be concerned about their teeth because of the effects that chemo has in general. And those things, if you, again, stay in a pre-preventive program, you go along and everything comes back and you're not at high risk for having dental problems the same way you would be with radiation in and around the head and neck area. Um, as it relates to teeth cleanings, most times during the time of your chemo, um, they prefer for you not to visit the dentist for usually two big reasons. One is, is that, as you well know, your counts can, can go down, your blood counts, so you just become a little bit more at risk for infection. And depending on what your chemo is, or certainly if you're in a uh, bone marrow transplant situation, you just want to stay out of an environment where you have lots of people coming in and out, where you're more prone to infection, and at the same time not breaking that blood. When we clean teeth, you know, you do bleed. Uh, and to in, uh, putting bacteria in your bloodstream, although the, it's a low risk, it's best if you're not having a problem uh, to, to not do that and deal with your cleaning during that time when your blood counts have uh, increased to a point where you're at less risk for a problem. Bone marrow transplant's a little bit of a different animal because as you well know, they 
before you go in for a bone marrow transplant, there again too, they'll usually want you to have a dental clearance. And the dental clearance is because as, the, as your uh, body uh, is being prepared for the bone marrow transplant, you're really weakening your immune system. And as part of weakening your immune system, if you have teeth that are on the verge of, or they're in a low-grade infection, once that immune system goes down, all of a sudden your dental problem can really go into high gear, particularly if you have gum-related problems. Uh, and when I say gum-related problems, I mean, as you, many of you know, when you go to the dentist and we poke around the teeth to see how your gum health is and what your bone support is, is you, if you have a significant bone loss problem where infection has a tendency to be ready to take off, in a healthy person it's not an issue, but when you've had bone marrow, in preparation for bone marrow transplant, your immune system can't fight off that infection the same way it can. So it's usually a good idea, and again, I can't emphasize, typically oncologists will want a clearance prior to that to make sure you don't have any teeth that might need to come out or try to get uh, things taken care of before you're uh, immunocompromised to that level. Uh, as always, things do happen. And if they happen in, during those times, that's where the dentists and oncologists really need to be in close contact so that whatever's being done as part of the treatment, the oncologist is aware and everything is being done so that uh, it's in your, uh, uh, it's in your uh, behalf to make sure that it goes along smoothly. Can you have implants after chemo? Yes. Can you have crowns after chemo? Yes. Can you have extractions after chemo? Yes. It's just all a matter of where, it, once the chemo is over, getting back to a kind of a normal blood count level uh, in, from a preventive dental care and all the things that go along with that. Typically, there's no risk. Whereas, of course, with the radiation, you have to be a little bit more aware of what you might be doing and what needs to be done in the mouth. Um, I'm going to bring up now uh, some of the what are called bisphosphonates. And they're used primarily for osteoporosis. But in today's world, uh, whether it might be for chemo with uh, breast cancer, depending on where you are staged and if it looks like it might be uh, beginning to affect the bone, uh, prostate cancer, uh, multiple myeloma, they might use these drugs that are called bisphosphonates. Now, the, the names on those are Actinol, Vosimax, Boniva, Reclast. Um, those types of drugs, particularly if they're given by uh, IV or uh, by injection, they, they're a little bit harder on your bone healing capabilities. So if you're having bone metastasis and they're going, to, they're going to be using those kinds of drugs, it's always good to take another good look at where you might be dentally with gum disease or teeth that might need to come out. Because it's typically best if you really try not to, if, to not take teeth out when you're on those medications. And the problem is there's a balance change with the cells that make bone and the cells that take away bone. And those medications really affect the cells that take away the bone. And when a tooth comes out, it can really affect healing. And what you get is that as the tooth comes out, the, the bone is exposed to the environment and it dies. It, the, you, it doesn't get taken away by the osteoclasts because they're not working the same way that they were prior to using those medications. So the bone works itself out. Uh, it, there's rarely pain with it. Uh, it's just, it's a, it's a nuisance. And um, it, it can get to the point where you keep losing bone, losing bone, losing bone, and 
It can be more of a problem. It's usually a, a slower process, but it can be multiple visits to the dentist or oral surgeon to remove those hard spicular areas of bone. Sometimes the oral surgeon can take away enough bone to where you get to live bone and then you're able to cover that over with gum tissue and you may have some success with gum coverage. But the best uh, treatment is prevention and to just try to be as proactive as you can with going on those medications to talk to the dentist, talk to an oral surgeon, talk to the oncologist. So you try to stay away from uh, extractions down the road. Uh, as we all know, things happen. And if it does happen, everybody just needs to be on the same page with when you might be going off those medicines. It's a little, every, there's protocols out there. They're learning all the time about what seems to be the best. But a lot of these medications are uh, not new, new, but new enough that uh, once they're in your system, they stay there a long time and there is a vacation time frame to be off of them. Uh, but in some situations, they, you know, your oncologist doesn't like for you to be off of them for a very long period of time. Um, so it's something to be very aware of. The other one I didn't mention is Prolia. I don't think I did, but again, Vosimax, Boniva, Reclass, Iridia, uh, Prolia are ones that uh, you just, if you're on those, it's, it's a red flag to, to dentists or oncologists if you had to have a tooth out. There's another uh, type of bisphosphonate that uh, actually builds bone. It's, they're, um, they're anabolic as opposed to making your cells slow down. They help build up bone. Those are Forteo and Timolus, T-Y-M-L-O-S. Uh, those are injections, but they act differently. Uh, so you can have a tooth out with those, and your risk for bone breakdown is a lot less. Typically, those are medications. It's a red flag. Uh, all your physicians will say you can't have that for any more than two years as part of your treatment protocol um, because... Uh, they have their own downsides, and if they have a high risk of uh, uh, causing osteosarcomas to form, so uh, it's something that they'll use for about two years, and then you're off of it. Uh, very similar to some of the bisphosphonates, so you're able to take them for so long, and then you have to change to something else because of the effects that those have on your cells. So these medications, as, as you well know, they change. There's different ones that come out, uh, but they are ones when you hear of what kind of effect of these, uh, this is a medication that's gonna affect your bone. You just wanna be aware of, okay, how is it gonna affect my bone as it relates to if for some reason I had to have a tooth out? And again, most times your oncologist will beyond that, but uh, as we all know over time, it's good to be your own advocate and be aware of that and certainly be aware of it um, as you talk to your dentist. Um, I, at this time, is kind of, uh, I'd, I'd like to go to questions, if there are any, Sue. Yeah, there are. Um, yep, I'm compiling, yes, okay, I'll start from the top. Okay. Okay, okay. so first question that is, um, uh, come in, and Karen has been answering some too, so um, uh, this first question is, I'm four weeks into IMRT4, a glioblastoma, no mouth sores, but I had some pre-existing dental issues which haven't gotten worse, at least not yet. Can I expect to, can I expect it to start, and when would it be a good time to get a dentist and to start to work in my teeth? So, I would say that you, uh, I wouldn't worry that all of a sudden there's going to be a time frame where uh, your dental work that needed to be done um, is, is going to start to become a problem. I'm kind of assuming that it may have been more elective treatment, meaning that you don't have a toothache, um, a, certainly a broken tooth, decay, uh, any of those kinds of things can happen after the treatment. 
I think now the only thing that may drive it is what your comfort level might be. And I would talk to your oncologist. You might say, <clears throat> excuse me, ask, here's where I am. Um, I had some pending dental work. Um, it was nothing that was of an immediate emergency type situation. When can I go back in to have that looked at? And um, usually the other thing as it relates to radiation is that they use a lot of mass now and, and direction of where the beam's going to go. So you may uh, not be experiencing mouth sores and, in fact, might be able to go in and have uh, dental treatment while the uh, treatment's being done, particularly if you're feeling okay, you know, if your blood counts are okay, if you feel if you're not too lethargic and or if you're not too vulnerable to being in an environment where there's lots of people where you could be more prone to infection. So good conversation to have with your physician. Certainly if it's a toothache, that you just want. Toothaches, whether you're pregnant or you're uh, in the midst of cancer treatment, uh, those can get really very, very uncomfortable. And there's things that can be done to get you out of pain without having a tooth out or doing a lot of dental work as a general rule so that you don't have to suffer during that time while you have all these other things going on in your life. Another question, a good one too. Uh, can chemo cause or contribute to teeth discoloration? They can. That varies a lot. Um, but you definitely can see that. Now, I, I'm not gonna say it happens to everybody, because I haven't seen it happen with everybody. You definitely see it sometimes happen in some people. And not to get too, um, uh, be too technical, but teeth are basically translucent. And most of the color of teeth come from inside. So you have an outer enamel layer, which is the hard protective part of the tooth. And that's, just to throw out numbers, is like 98% mineralized. Once you, that's about a millimeter and a half thick. And then you get into what's called the dentin. The dentin is about 75% mineralized, but it has a lot of color. Matter of fact, uh, for many of us uh, that are 60 and over early on in life would have had tetracycline. Even tetracycline and, uh, that you may take as you age, it'll discolor teeth because of the way it binds to calcium. And it's binding into that dentin that causes the issue. But as you have some of these different chemotherapy agents and add, there is blood flow into the center of the tooth, it can have an effect on that dentin. The other thing that can happen is that the inside of the tooth, just over time and with uh, lots of medical issues, the, the tooth can calcify more on the inside of the tooth where it becomes more dense. And as it becomes more dense, the translucency changes into the tooth and that can have an effect. But it, I, I can't say that there's a specific chemotherapy that's going to cause um, tooth discoloration, but certainly everybody is affected in different ways. And through the years, you can see people that definitely notice an effect. It may be that when you finish the chemotherapy, there's bleaching that can be done. Uh, it's, it's simple. It doesn't hurt the teeth. Most of you probably are very aware of it with tray bleaching, where you make a tray, it goes on, you put a bleach gel in. Even with significant tetracycline, doing that for four to six weeks, can have a, 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 a positive effect. The negative effect is sometimes that it can make your teeth sensitive to cold uh, and brushing your teeth, it goes away. You know, if you need to take a day or two off, take a day or two off from the bleaching. But uh, there, there, in a chemotherapy situation, it wouldn't be one of those things to say, oh, I can't bleach my teeth. I would just, when you're out of it, you the chemo and you feel better, try tray bleaching or at least talk to your dentist about it as a possibility for you as it might be helpful. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that all chemotherapy causes discoloration, but everybody's different 
everybody's affected by those things differently. And, and it's not to say that it can't happen and not that it, I haven't seen it happen over time with different patients. Uh, another question, uh, what are your feelings about the medication Zonita? Does that cause any issues with teeth? Zometa, so I'm not sure how to pronounce, but... Right, so Zometa is one of the bisphosphonates, and that has a, an effect on the bone. So your biggest effect there is that if you had to have a tooth out, everybody needs to be aware and to be talking about what the benefits would be depending on where the tooth is that needs to come out um, is a, a, taking a vacation from that. And there again, oftentimes what will happen is, is that you'll have your Zometa, and then on your next cycle when you're to have it is the time that you might take the tooth out, and then you wouldn't take it again until your next cycle. Now, the problem with that is that pain. You know, you can't be in pain or infection for six months. Sometimes it just has to happen. And that's where you talk to the oral surgeon and oncologist because you have to get your, get out of pain. You can't be on, you know, high dose pain medicines or antibiotics for that time frame while you're waiting for your tooth to come out. I mean, stuff does happen where you have to act a little bit more aggressively. But Zometa is one of those that you definitely want to be aware of for the tooth coming out. It doesn't make you any more prone to decay doesn't mean that uh, you can't have a crown, doesn't mean that you can't have a filling, but if you were to have an implant or you were to have a tooth out, it can definitely play, it plays a role that everyone should be very aware of. Uh, another question, uh, anything uh, to do for sore, swollen gums with chemotherapy, also sore teeth with chewing? This, yeah, so with gums, uh, one of the things is, and, and you're probably already doing this, and I don't want to take it to a point where I'm not taking care of one of the, uh, that you're not taking care of your teeth, but if it's possible, um, and you know chemo's coming up, and you typically, maybe you do have some gum issues, it's just to make sure you get a good, you know, dental prophylaxis and cleaning. Um, Bacteria, as it, sits, as it stays in and around the gums, causes your gums to become red and bleedy. And sometimes some of the medications can cause it to be more red and bleedy. So your hygiene care, and I know this is old story, you know, brushing your teeth lightly at the gum line. Some people say, well, my gums hurt, I don't want to brush my gums. It just means that you need to brush them a little bit more. In today's world with Sonicares, and, uh, which are the automatic toothbrushes and the um, uh, bronze, those are great brushes to put toothpaste on and gently hold it into your gums so that it stimulates them. The other thing that can be helpful, they're called little soft picks. And the soft pick actually fits in between your teeth. You can put a little toothpaste on that or a little Sensodyne, which is a uh, toothpaste for sensitive teeth. Work that between your teeth. Helping stimulate your gums is making those gums where they become puffy and red and they start to firm up and come right around your teeth. If you have a heavy buildup and, you know, as you go around and have your teeth clean and the scraping that goes on, you might be familiar with calculus where it's a hard deposit on teeth. Sometimes that'll form just underneath the gums and it can make your teeth really, really red and sore as it relates to uh, chemo. Now if you're finding that you're having that and it, uh, it's just not going away and depending on when your last dental visit, it may be worth a look just to see if that's there. Because if it is, and assuming your blood counts are at a good level, it's helpful to get that off your teeth. Uh, sometimes some of the products I might recommend, well, you'll be like, well, it doesn't really do anything. Well, sometimes the irritant that's underneath there just hasn't had a chance to get off. So you always want to check that. If the gums are really red and swollen, and 
Uh, it's, and it doesn't seem to be from infective reasons, whether it's from the plaque, the hard calculus buildup, and you're not having any improvement with the uh, brushing of the teeth and using the soft picks, and you've seen the dentist, sometimes you can use a, a steroid mouth rinse. Um, the steroid mouth rinse is something you can rinse with. You don't swallow it, but it's called a Decadron elixir. It is a prescription. Um, and what you do is you rinse with that and it helps with inflammation. But if it's related to infection, you want to make sure that the source of that is taken care of, which would be the plaque or the hard tartar buildup on the teeth. Um, so I might say, if it's been a little while since you've seen the dentist, it might be worth a check. Um, you can always use to start with, brush your gums, give them some stimulation, use a soft pick using a normal um, uh, uh, toothpaste and see what happens because it's worthwhile to give that gum some stimulation to see if it, if it improves at all. One last question and that is um, your feelings on periosciance gel. Well, I would say with those periosciance gels, it's like it's, it's not a panacea but I think that as you, um, if you're more prone to gum problems, as an example, there's a toothpaste, I think it's by Colgate, um, called PerioCare, or this is when I need our hygienist, uh, Karen, here. I think she's listening. Um, it's, a, it's a toothpaste that's focused on the gums, not unlike what Perio gel would be. And taking those things and working those in and around the gums can be helpful. I mean, it, it may not take it all away, but it can be helpful. You'll hear sometimes, or at the dentist, there's some antibiotics that we can put in and around the gum. They don't necessarily make it completely go away, but they can be helpful in times when you have a, a gum abscess or a gum irritation that's uh, uh, been precipitated. And once everything is cleaned out, sometimes we'll use some of those products to help encourage the gums to heal. So uh, it, oftentimes it's using lots of different things at the same time, whether it's perio gel, it's toothpaste directed toward the gum, again stimulating the gum with the soft pick or putting the perio gel on the soft pick, working it in between your teeth along with your toothpaste uh, to help stimulate that gum to start to shrink up around the tooth and get uh, much firmer. It's one of those things where you have a flappy gum. Flappy gum, lots of stuff gets in between. Tight gums, it's harder for things to get in between. So you're trying to tighten those gums up with the stimulation, these different products to uh, help out. And Karen came through Paradontex. Paradontex, yes. I don't know, Karen, if you have any comments related to Perio gel. I think that is our last. Wait, I do have one more question. Um, and you may have answered this, but uh, can I or should I still chew sugar-free gum while undergoing cancer? Oh, treatment? thank you. Yes, what is the story on sugar-free gum? So there's so many different sugar-free gums, and I'm glad that was brought up because I'll always, even for those that don't have cancer, and you're seeing a different decay pattern. Bacteria is really smart. Of course, when we grew up, it was juicy fruit, spearmint, and all the good bubble yubbles that were full of sugar and were fun to, to chew on. In today's world, almost you see more sugar-free gum than you do the regular sugar gum. The problem with, uh, not the problem, but not unlike what you're seeing with, and I don't want to put bacteria in our mouth and related to coronavirus, but they figure out how to make things work, whether they mutate as a coronavirus mutates or a bacteria that figures out how to use different carbohydrates to survive. So a lot of the bacteria in our mouth, whereas before we just thought of it using sugar, so it takes in the sugar, metabolizes it, gives off an acid, and that's what causes tooth decay, they can use a lot of the different 
sugar-free gums the same way they used to use the sugar that was in juicy fruit or spearmint. So when you see sugar-free gum, you think, well, I'm, I'm home free, I shouldn't have a problem. This is where xylitol comes into play. And xylitol is a, a sugar-free, it's a substitute for sugar that the bacteria really hasn't figured out how to use. So if you look at your product, see that it says xylitol. If it has some of the other sugar-free additives, um, try to just stay away from those and use the one that has xylitol. Now, I'd mentioned Spry before. They make a gum, and that gum is sugar-free, and it's a good gum to use because it has xylitol. It's not the only one. You just have to be pretty specific when you look in, whether it's Trident or Wrigley Sugar Free, well, what are they using as a sweetener? And if the sweetener is xylitol, you know, that, that would be a better choice to use, and, and it's okay to do that. But you wouldn't want to use just any sugar free gum, uh, or certainly gum in general, to try to stimulate uh, saliva, particularly when your mouth is very dry. Sue, thank you. Always a pleasure to be with Living Well. They're always very good here. If you have questions that might come in later, be, they can pass them on to me, or if you're having a hard time, just let us know. So thank you very much.